My fellow Ambazonians, this is Dr. Cho Ayaba. Today is the 28th of August, 2024, and this is my daily briefing. I have a couple of things to address, which are very important. Number one is the state of our resistance. And I think, as you can see with the daring um, action in Boya, in Bui, in Mezam, um, our forces have been challenging um, the occupier in, in ways that we can only appreciate. And so we thank them for this steadfastness. And as we move into the dry season, we will be entering a season of resistance. And I ask each and every one of you who believes in our freedom, the freedom of our prisoners, the return of our refugees, to step up their commitment to these brazen warriors who have refused to blink. The second issue I'd like to talk about is the continuous effort by <laughs> once president <laughs> and now member of the surrender team, Chris Anna. Um, the other day he went out talking about um, a referendum. My people, I know this is a sensitive topic and sometimes we may come across as, you know, warmongering that we do not want to tolerate alternative ideas. Sometimes it is always very important to understand the motivation of people and also to look at history. It is the absence of these two considerations that took us from an independent country into an enslaved people. Shortcuts are appealing. Even the Bible says it. The road to hell is broad, void of obstacles. After more than 130 years under occupation, at this stage, we should take every overture with caution. We should refuse to embrace the python simply because it doesn't work its tongue. I had addressed this issue of a, a referendum. Why would a man who calls himself the president of Ambazonia suddenly from nowhere goes on the air with a couple of white people telling you they have gotten a lobbyist, flew a flag over a illusionary embassy in Washington, comes after a few months, never gives you any briefing on what has happened with those lobbyists and then he goes on another tangent on the issue of a referendum. Referenda are organized by occupying states. I have said this many times. The United Nations in situations of occupation where the occupier is recognized as mm. United Nations has recognized the occupier as a de facto, de jure, legitimate or illegitimate occupier. The United Nations requires its acceptance for a referendum to be organized. We recognize in Spain, I think in the Catalonia area, they organize a referendum for independence. Okay? These, these examples are important. They got a very big majority for independence. But because Spain is seen as the de jure or legitimate authority over this area, the referendum was seen as an attack on Spain's uh, sovereignty by the Spanish government. Most of those who organized that referendum are taking refuge in uh, in Belgium or are in jail 
forget about being jailed. We think about the validity of the referendum. In the case of the United Kingdom, Scotland cannot get up one day and organize a referendum or the United Nations cannot get up one day and try to organize a referendum for Scotland. It requires England to be able to organize, to accept that the referendum will take place. East Timor, it was uh, President Suharto who organized the referendum then backed by the United Nations. Eritrea was Ethiopia. The United Nations provide uh, support. Now, let me take you back to the liberation uh, cases. In the case of East Timor, sustainability of Indonesian occupation of East Timor was under attack, was seen as unsustainable. And so when a new president emerged, they saw an exit through a referendum for first autonomy and if overwhelming votes for independence, then for independence. For Eritrea, as I said before, the Eritreans had already captured their capital. The referendum served two purposes, legitimate reintegration into the international system and a non-total collapse exit of Ethiopia. South Sudan was the same, so we can go on and on. So these are the facts of history that we must always take into consideration. The second issue to consider for an occupied people who are already in arms resistance is at what stage would you call for a referendum without making yourself looking stupid or without making yourself, presenting yourself to your people and to the occupier as having been defeated. At what stage would you do that? That is why all those who want to talk about it usually do so at a, the position of strength. When they tell the occupier, hey, listen, we will collapse your system or you can find an exit and, and get a referendum. And when the occupier judges keenly that there are only two alternatives, exit by collapse and surrender, or exit with a good face through a referendum. They usually bow for a referendum. The third is what motivates these people? What motivates them? Talking about a referendum. Is it for Ambazonia? So if you bring in all of these factors that I have uh, explained, if any of them held through, through, then you would say, yes, maybe they've considered that we are in the position of ultimate strength. Or they've considered that Cameroon is inching towards that and then they push it. None of these factors exist. So what is their motivation? Number one is to remain relevant. They have lost all the arguments. These guys cannot raise $2,000. So it's impossible to even pay a TV station. It's impossible to survive. It is impossible to, to, I mean, to deal with any defense on the ground. So in their struggle to remain relevant, they create a distraction to manipulate our people, to deceive our people, to take their eyes off the ball against an occupier that has made it absolutely clear that violence is its only path towards reconquering Ambazonia. They are aware that those running Yaoundé have made it absolutely clear that their strategy is decapitation. Take out all the first tier top generals, move to the second tier, and then undermine the resistance. And then use blackmail internationally to pressure governments to undermine the leadership. That is the strategy of the occupier. So you are not dealing with a system that has shown any signs that you could say, oh, 
this is a sign let's, let's capitalize on. Third, this is a system that has never organized any free and fair election even for a chief tenancy. So how, how do you, in a position of weakness like these people are, contemplate that such a system, even if out of nowhere will offer a referendum as an exit strategy, it will guarantee, you know, that it is going to be free and fair. At least at a time when they have no choice than to exit through a referendum, they will have to make it to be free and fair because it's an exit strategy. It's not a consideration for reoccupation. Most referenda for independence is on the basis that there is a sizable majority, even in democracies where it has been lost, like in Scotland, the sentiment, the Scots themselves don't simply push for a referendum without internal polling that gives them the barometer to say, well, a sizable majority of Scots want to bail out. Maybe during the campaign, the politics of the United Kingdom far beats that of nationalism. So these these are these are these are facts. This team surrender, if you look at them, uh, Akwanga, Chris Anu, Fontem. There is something that they are scared of, and we know it. All this tongue wagging on social media, our people, these people will betray Ambazonia at the first sign of it, because these are people who betray individuals. These are people who call for the killing of soldiers. These are people that will betray their own comrades. And what is Ambazonia for them? They will betray it at the least opportunity. And so my people, it is not the desire for continuous resistance that makes us, you know, to be against some of these experiments. It's that the facts of history and the facts of the state we are against does not lend credence to any of these superstition. Now, it is, it is critical for us to know what, what motivates these people. Because these are people who call themselves, they were also commander-in-chiefs. They were military fatigues running around. They have all abandoned, abandoned those titles because they are trying to satisfy a certain section of the international community for their own security and freedom. For, for, for them now, it's about their survival. Ambazonia is simply a platform. Ambazonia is a platform. They may be more concerned with some of the issues because it gives them, it gives them relevance, it gives them access to, to money which they, are, they, can, they can steal for their own personal survival. Ambazonia is not a consideration. It is too difficult for them. But what they do not understand is, this is a collective fight. I may be weak sometimes, and I get up one morning, and I'm like, mountain lion has taken, oh Jesus, say, thank God, Father. Thank you. Thank you for inspiring these men to keep us coping. Thank you for giving them the ability to be able to stand against this occupier, to keep our prisoners hopeful. Ambazonians in their majority on a daily basis when our forces move on the offensive, they walk on the street with their heads up. They look at the occupier smiling in their heart and say, they showed you people today. And, 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 and so we must persevere. We must sacrifice. We must not be a people who through time and space, we give up our gains for an illusion. We give up what we have gotten because of a promise by a barbarian that has never kept to its word. We interpret, you know, the, the actions of the international community as, you know, this thing is somehow impossible. The slam on us, on our faces, the idea of a failed state theory. As though some of them never fought for independence. As though they never defended them, themselves against tyranny. 
as though post independence states must be must be stable must just be flourishing even japan that was nuked even dresden that was carpet bombed needed support post world war ii support for reconstruction so to look at south sudan that is relying on some credit in systems paying debt that an occupier accrued to have simply emerged as an america is a fantasy so we must refuse to succumb we must refuse to be manipulated amazonians everything we do in our lives requires effort it requires perseverance all this fantasy that has been pumped from the past several years oh we got to be united you want to unite with who we are united the amazonian people are united for independence not because some guys are sitting somewhere in the comfort of their rooms on what's up and making noise should everyone you know recognize them and that will give you what you call kind of the credibility for amazonia to move forward it's a fallacy yes unity is good but you can't simply just live in the neighborhood and then you think that you know all the traitors in the neighborhood if we all come together you defend that neighborhood or all the armed robbers if we all unite with them it will keep armed robbers from infiltrating that neighborhood unite with them they will then know when you are on guard to tell their friends out when to rob people must be determined the way you speak about it the way you demonstrate about it the way your posture is should tell your enemy that you are no blinking type we should not be running around like a people who don't own this land. We should not be going around beggarly as a people who are not entitled to freedom. Every now and then, a group of people just come from nowhere. In August, they want to change the date of the commencement of our school year. Without the least consideration that you could give parents one year to factor this in. Who is, who is, who is dictating the terms? Do you think these are the same? These guys by themselves in August sat and made this decision. The next thing they will tell you is that, well, ghost town has a cost, has a price. They never tell you that being in jail has a cost. We should do a rescue plan to go and rescue prisoners. You've never heard them come out with a plan. How do we rescue these guys in Kondengi? It is only how do we collapse our mode of resistance in the name of our people. Now they tell you, oh, it's a referendum, oh, the armed struggle is not going anywhere. Look, my people, no armed struggle, no Ambazonia. No armed struggle, no Ambazonia. Take this to any bank. So I, 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 I ask each and every one of you, listening to me, some said, oh, you know, um, People are running behind, they're talking about a leader, they're always talking about a leader, we should talk about which people live without a leader, in the home even there is a leader, in church there is a leader, you go to job there is a leader, in your school there is a leader. What is the question of leadership in Ambazonia inconsistent with the notion of nationalism? Why is it a threat? Why must Ambazonia be leaderless before we feel like we love Ambazonia? If you have your own leader and you believe in that leader, follow the leader. But to always attack people who think a leader is required, one who is tested and proven, who has not blinked, is become a crime that must be undermined. It's hypocritical. Everywhere you go, you worship your pastors in church. You go to the neighborhood, you bow to the chief. Even those who are traitors. I saw all the monk on traitors in the United States bowing to Anguafo. And then when you stand and recognize the one that is fighting for the liberation of your homeland, it is problematic. No, they are afraid. They are afraid of the truth.
And it is on that basis that our resistance is anchored. Ambazonia has prevailed. All the experiments of Cameroon in Ambazonia has failed. All has failed. They have the last instrument in their hands, propaganda. They think they can threaten people. These are criminals who burned thousands of villages, locked up our people in their jails. Those who even escaped with kidnap and rendition, put through kangaroo trials and locked up in perpetuity. Who, do, who the hell do they think they can threaten? The land is not theirs, it's ours. And they stay there at a cost, a high one. The guy who was killed in Boya, one of them, the Amazonian, that is the same guy when people were murdered in Manfe. He was around running his mouth in different WhatsApp groups, threatening people. He's gone down, fighting for an enemy, a traitor for an occupying state. I thank all the brave Amazonian soldiers who have left the system. I thank even the Cameroonian soldiers who have left. And I ask those still anchoring themselves in this collapsing system to abandon it. To look at what is happening in Burkina Faso. To see Niger, brave men rising up, challenging autocrats and taking over. However, whatever becomes of the country, bravery is what we will salute today. And that is what we must be counted for doing. Look at Ambazonia across the world. Men, able-bodied men, they are cowering to tyranny. They are running behind little, little opportunities. When Ambazonian resistance at this phase started, all of them were jumping. As they got small jobs, some got married. It's become too risky, too difficult. They start speaking with one tongue on the right. No, struggle is sacrifice. Be ready to die, go to jail. Without that consideration, we will never be free. For all countries that have been freed and those that are still fighting, there is a price they have paid. Amazonia will not be different. 